Um, yeah, so thank you. So, um, so yeah, this uh, talk will be very, uh, it will be technical, but very easy to follow, I hope. Um, so yeah, I will, it's a joint work with uh, Amir Yudayov from last summer. And I will only describe our work maybe in 20 or 30 minutes, because first I want to begin with a quick introduction to, to abstract convexity spaces. And then I will describe the context of our main results and our main result. And then I'll, I hope I can give all the proofs without omitting any detail. OK, so, so what is a convexity space? So this is uh, an attempt to abstract the notion of Euclidean convexity. So, so definition, um, a pair X, C, where uh, C is a subset of is a family of subsets of X is a convexity space if um, so the empty set and X are in C both the empty sets and X are convex sets and C is closed under the intersection Okay, so you can verify that these properties are satisfied by convex uh, sets in uh, yeah, not necessarily so intersections. I mean arbitrary intersections, but we will focus on. I mean, you can think of, of finite or countable. Uh, I will mention something maybe, but Just some like weaker notion of a topology. Right. Yeah. So soon we'll see many examples, but before that, let me gi give just one more definition. So B. A, a convex, so the, conve the sets in C, we will call them convex sets, but it's not necessarily the usual convex set. So B is a half space if, who wants to, to complete the definition? If B bar is also, if B bar is also in C. That's what I... So the empty set is also half space according to this definition, but uh, but that's fine. Okay. So I will I will soon tell you the history. There's actually a lot of history behind these definitions, but uh, let's first see some examples. Um, okay. So the first example is. Maybe the most trivial one, x two to the x. Right. This is a all possible subsets or convex sets. This is a trivial convexity space. There's a second example that maybe is the motivating example, is R D. And uh, you know, C subset R D. C is convex. OK, that's uh, also not very surprising. A third one, which is a little bit more interesting, take, take ZD, take the, the integer lattice, and take C intersection ZD, where C in RD is convex. OK, that's uh, a little bit more. The, that's we'll call this the. Yes, so th there is a notion of convexity subspace, like in topology. You can, and you can also always define it. So this is one example of a, of a subspace convexity. OK, Again, OK, now a bit 
maybe I should have written it before. So take, you know, in topology, take the collection of closed sets in a topological space. It's also a convexity space. Closed sets in any topology. Yes, yes. It's just an example, right? So it satisfies both all the definitions here, right? Yeah. Um, like two is finite uh, or intersections? All of them. intersections. Okay. Here's another interesting example. So also in algebra. So take your favorite algebraic uh, structure, group, rings, fields. You can build, you know, groups are closed under intersections. So I'll just do it for groups, but you can do for whatever you want. So, so let um, you know. So, G minus E, and the convexity space will be all um, H minus E, where H is a subgroup of G. So is yeah. So is the unity is the unit of the group. So I remove the so. I could say that I removed the unit to satisfy this condition, but that's not the truth. Uh, otherwise, things become trivial. And, um, <laughs> but it also satisfies this definition now. Um, OK. OK, here's another example, mo maybe more related to computer science, but also to topology. So take um, 0, 1 to the n. N doesn't have to be finite, but just, let's just keep this notation. And uh, you know, uh, all, all subcubes. Uh, so C subset C is a subcube. So in topology, it's called cylinder. Subcubes are called cylinders. What I mean by a subcube is that it's any set that is obtained by Picking any finite, any, any 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 subset of the coordinates, and you know fixing them to zero or one, any any set that can be represented this way, and you know the rest of the coordinates are free, you can do whatever you want. That's not really. That's a basis for the Cantor topology. It's not <coughs> all the all the. It's a or. Yes, yes. Okay, and and the. Uh, Last example, uh, which is also so, yeah. Take take a tree. Take any tree, your favorite tree, and look at all v. Um, yeah, look at the convexity space v and all c subset v. C is connected. Yeah, so take all, all subtrees of a, of a given tree. So this is a special case of geodesic convexity. And geodesic convexity is a metric space where there is a unique shortest path between any two points. And that's the case for there's only one path, actually, one simple path. OK. Um, You could take a what? Uh? Like the whole tree, for example. It's not no, no, it's not. It's the, it, the, it works for any uh, topology, whether it's unique to the set. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's not that they construct the set. The convex sets are just connected. Yeah, where you contain all shortest path, basically. Or, uh, it's like generated by the geodesic. Yeah. OK, um, OK, now let me give you a little bit of history. So this was introduced, this definition was introduced by Friedrich Wilhelm Levy in 51. And uh, he was a German mathematician. And uh, he was, uh, as you can infer by his last name, he was Jewish. And during the war, he, he actually uh, escaped to India. So he worked in Calcutta for 15 years. And, uh, and he did a lot of abstract algebra there. And it's interesting to compare him with uh, another Jewish uh, professor, uh, Hausdorff, who tried to escape to the US, but he couldn't get any research, uh, any positions. 
and he ended up um, committing suicide with his wife. Maybe if he would have tried uh, Calcutta or other, he would have survived. Um, there is also a good survey about absolute convexity by Dancer, Grunbaum, and Klee. Um, Grunbaum, he was in the Hebrew University and in Washington, and I think, yeah, so Ilya is somehow related to Grunbaum because Ilya is the student of Elon Lindenstrauss, and Elon Lindenstrauss is the son of Joram Lindenstrauss, and Joram Lindenstrauss is the, was the student of uh, Grunbaum. And um, yeah, and Klee is also, is the one that I think provided with Minsky, I think, Minky, Minsky, or Minky, the, the example where uh, the simplex method can take exponentially many steps. So he gave a polytop. Minty. Minty. Yeah, Klee and Minty, yeah. So this is Klee and the other co-author is Minty. So this is also from 63. There is a more recent book by Van de Velle, who is a Dutch mathematician. And you can find it online and uh, okay, so now let's continue. So um, and also one 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 quote of uh, of Henry Poincaré that this uh, this definition and examples reminded me of is that you know in. So, so there was, okay, I wrote it to myself, so you will not uh, screw up. So, uh, yes, yeah, so someone said to Poincaré that poetry is the art of giving different names to the same thing. And Poincaré replied that mathematics is the art of giving the same name to different things. <laughs> so, I think this is one example of uh, how it happens. Okay, so let's continue to the technical stuff. Okay, so let's discuss some invariants that we will be concerned with. Some so yeah, you can define, you know, in a natural way, isomorphisms between convexity spaces, and let's look at some important invariants that we will, uh, we will study. So the first one will be separability. So, so yeah, so uh, x, c, is separable if for every x not in C, uh, which is in, so for every point that is not in a convex set. Uh, here C is, uh, is not all, C is a set, it's not all of the convex No, no, C is all convex, all convex yeah, sets. Is a con yeah, maybe it's, uh, let's call it, yeah, I don't want to call it H. But, but, yeah, I will keep, the big C is the collection of all convex sets, the small C is a member, is it just a single convex set, and what, okay, so I want to define separability. So we have a point, and we have a, we have a point that does not belong to a convex set. What the separability means? There is a separating ha half space, yeah. So uh, there is a half space. That separates, uh, that separates, namely the half space contains x, but is disjoint from c, or, by, or the complement is containing c, or it is joined from x. Okay, so that's uh, yeah. So let's look at the example. So the first three are separable, right? Four, okay, four is depending on the topology, I guess. Um, yeah, by the way, it's in, so, so, so three is separable, right? The lattice convex set is separable because, you know, any, if a point is not in, if a, a lattice point is not in a convex set, so also there is a, there is a half space separating in the, in the underlying domain, so it's also separated there. But it's interesting to note that there are other stronger notions of separability so for example, you can define separability, I think it's separability two, or I don't know the name, but now between two, co two convex sets, two disjoint convex sets. So you want now that, let's say, uh, any two disjoint convex sets will have a separating hyperplane. So notice that for this stronger notion of separability, actually number three is not separable. 
So it is separable for point and uh, and um, and sets, but not between two convex sets. And to see why this is the case, take the Boolean cube, take zero one to the d. So any any subset there is convex. So any partition of the Boolean cube, if you take the convex out of two parts, it will be disjoint. But you cannot realize every partition with a linear f with a hyperplane. So I, I mean you don't need to understand it now, but I'm just saying that there are different notions of separability. All of them are, sub, you know, these are just abstra abstraction of Han Banach theorems. But if you look at other spaces, even very geometric spaces like this, they don't all satisfy it. Convex halves in the in the in the lattice. Because you know, you basically have points in convex positions whose interior contains no lattice point. That's what you need. And so why, why, are not that, uh, why are not all of these hyperplanes? Uh, you can just count how many how many threshold functions you have on the cube, and it's too too little. Well, a half space is uh, isn't it anything with complemented half space? Yes. Complemented yes. Right, so Complement with respect to to the whole space to z to the d. No, it's z to the d. It's all the integer lattice. And inside z to the d, we have the cube. And I, cl I claim that in the cube, you can find two disjoint convex sets yeah. that are not separated by a hyperplane. So when you take the complement of one of them, you get the everything in z to the d? No, no, no. I'm just saying take, take any threshold function that is not, lin that is not uh, take any partition of the Boolean cube that is not induced by a threshold function. There are it's such. Parity. By th parity. parity, yeah. So I'm, I claim that the convex hull of, you know, of the zeros of the parity and the convex hull of the ones of the parity, they do intersect in Rd, but they do not intersect in Z to the D. Right, so why, why aren't they defined? You define half, half spaces. So why, and these are not half spaces. No, they're not half spaces. They're, you know, any half space in Z to the D is yeah, infinite. Half spaces in, in six, but any half space in Z to the D is infinite, right? These are finite sets. OK. okay. Okay, so this is one invariant we will, we will be concerned with. The other thing is radon. So what is the radon number? So yeah, so y subset of x. Ah, by the way, I forgot to say that you can define the notion of convex hull in this setting in an abstract way. Your, uh, convex hull of uh, any set is just the intersection of all convex sets containing it. OK, so I will use the notion convex hull, but I don't mean the Euclidean notion. So why is, R in, is radon independent? So when is y radon independent? If for every. Partition y y prime y prime prime of y uh, the convex halves are disjoint. R is just definition. Rad radon. Is R radon independent? If, uh, yes, yeah, so what is the radon number? So I would like to define it as the maximal independent set, but unfortunately, the typical definition is the minimal k such that no set of size k is independent. So it's the maximal independent set plus one. <laughs> that's the, yeah, that's the. Yeah. What do I miss? Why you say the R? No, so, okay, so yeah, so uh, R no, Y is R independent R if for every partition of, of Y, the convex halves of the two parts are, are disjoint. So the, the radon number. What do you mean for every R? You should replace 
Maybe there are many radons, you know, Yaz yeah, 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 kids yeah, and... Yeah. <laughs> uh, Yuval, what is his first name? Johan. Johan, thank you. So the Johan radon number is the... is the maximal... is the, yeah, is the size of maximal independent set. Unfortunately, we have this confusing plus one, plus one, okay? So, okay, just one last uh, definition and then we, we will do more interesting things. Heli, heli number. So you can also define Karatodori number and you can basically take all you know, this classical results in convex geometry. So what is the Heli number? So is the minimum H such that um, any finite family uh, with an empty intersection family of sets. yes any family of convex sets with an empty intersection who oh. sorry ah or everything yeah yeah so who wants to complete the definition? So any finite family with an empty intersection contains subset of su subfamily contains a subfamily of size at most h with an empty intersection. Yeah, so you can think of it that if, you, as if, if I give you a very large family and the intersection of everything is empty, then you have a very short proof just of size h, a subfamily of size h. It already uh, shows that... Uh, so, so it's not a so non-empty subsection you want. It's this, so if all, subset of size, if all subfamilies of size h are intersecting, then ev also everything is intersecting. So it's a contrapositive. Um, yeah, so, but so you can think of, so you can also define Karatodori, which I want, but all these are some kind of combinatorial notions of independence that in the canonical example in RD, they're all equivalent to in the linear independence or often independence, but, um, but they can be very different in general. Um, let's maybe, okay, so maybe let's see some, let's, Let's check what is the other number for some of these examples. Um, so I wrote. Um, okay, so what is the radon number in the first example? So right, every set is radon independent, and therefore it's x plus one. In the second example, radon theorem t tells us that it's d plus two. So it's again, it's one more than the largest affine independent set. Here it's also um, t plus two. Um, four, let's forget it now. Five, actually, it's interesting. The notion of radon independence, what it means for, uh, so if you have a bunch of elements in a group, so what does it mean that they are radon independent? It means that if you look at, any, if you partition them to two parts and you look at the generated subgroups by each part, they will only intersect in the unity. So it's, it's yeah smells like independence, right? It's a, right, so any two partitions generate almost disjoint groups as much as they can be. Um, in six, the Radon number, it's a theorem by Shmuel On from the 90s, it's n times two to the n, order of n times, actually there is a lower bound of two to the n and an upper bound of, 
order of n times 2 to the n, so. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So I, um, let's see what did I write. You're right. <laughs> ah, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Not a, uh, I mean, okay, I'm sorry, I confused you, I confused myself. Let's start over here. Here, the radical number is not d plus two. It's at least two to the d. Same example, the Boolean cube shows it is, it's at least two to the d. But it's at most uh, d times two to the d. And that's a theorem of Shmuel only. Okay? Sorry. No, here it's, uh, for the Boolean cube, it's uh, log n. It's roughly log n. It's a, it's, it's a n? Sorry? N? Log n, log n. I think so, I think so. I didn't, uh, we, can do, we can make the calculation later. No, so I said here the radical number is at least 2 to the d. And you said that the, uh, the lower bound comes from the cube. I think so, yes. We can... Okay, and yeah, by the way, um, yeah, and le let's, okay, let's do just all, all examples for 7, okay? So 7, by the way, is it separable or not? What are the half spaces of, of, uh, of, um, of uh, you know? So remember, here we look at the tree. Of, uh, where it separates by one. Exactly. You just remove an edge. You remove an edge, and then you get two subtrees. These are complementary connected subtrees. So the half spaces are just obtained by picking an edge and removing. So here, actually, we have the stronger notion of convexity. If you have two, two disjoint uh, Connected self trees, there is an edge that separates them. Just take the shortest path and remove any edge on the. So this is this, this is separate. This is even strongly separable. Um, yeah, the radon number here it's a bit tedious, but it's four. I mean, it's at most four. For some trees, it's less. So some trees, it's tight. And the heli, heli number actually, what what is the heli number here? Uh, it's very small, yeah. It's I think it's two. So if you if you if any two subtrees intersect, if you have a family of subtrees and any two of them intersect, then all of them intersect. It's like intervals. It's the same like intervals. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, I have a lot of time. Good. Okay, so now just to. Last part of the warm up will be to prove a theorem um, by Levy. So, theorem. So, for every convexity space, we have that the Heli number is at most the Radon number. Okay? I will use it later. That's why I'm proving it. Um, so this was proved in this language by Levy, but it is in fact the same proof that uh, Radon gave for Halley's theorem in 23. It's just you need to know this that it, uh, it carries. It's interesting to know that the proof that Halley gave for Halley's theorem is very geometrical. So I don't think you can you use the probability in a very, you use hyper hyperplane, you use induction. I don't think you can extend it in this abstract. So in some sense. Radon's proof for Halley's theorem is, is better. Um, okay, so let's let's prove it. Okay, so so um, we'll actually prove the contrapositive. So um, so yeah, so it suffices to find points x one x2, xh in x that are radon independent, right? So we know that the Halley number is h, and it's enough to find the h points that are uh, radon independent. OK, so where do we find these points? So I claim that uh, since the Halley number is h, we know that there exist convex sets C1, C2, C3, 
up to CH uh, such that every H minus one um, of them intersect, but uh, you know, intersection I one to H CI is empty. Okay, let's let's convince ourselves why is this true. So what does it mean that the heading number is H? It means that it's larger than H minus one. So there is some finite family, maybe of size larger than H, such that every H minus one intersect, but not the whole family. I claim that this family must have a, a subfamily of size H with this property, because um, if not, then, then, yeah. I mean, there is some, yeah. If not, then, then, then we will have the, the heli condition. OK, so how? So you take all the intersection points of the subset of size H and of the H minus 1 intersection. Yes, exactly, exactly. So the points that we're going to, to use for uh, the, the independent set we're going to build, we're just to take, so for every, every i, pick some, um, let's see that I'm doing it correctly. Um, yeah, pick xi such that xi is in cj if and only if i is not j. OK, so I pick. So we know that uh, that um, that all the rest have a non-empty intersection, but once we add CI, it becomes empty. So just take any point from all the rest, and they claim that this must be Radon independent. So why is it Radon independent? So um, what do we need to prove? What does it mean to be Radon independent? So we need to prove that for any partition of these points to two parts, the convex hulls are disjoint. And now it requires a little bit of meditation to <laughs> digest the definition, but take any partition of these points. So if you take the intersection of uh, convex sets that correspond to this partition, so you have, uh, yeah, so let's say one part is one, two, and three, and the other part is all the rest. So take C1 intersection, intersection C2, intersection C3. This will contain all the other points, xi for i larger than 3. And the rest, C3 up to CH, will contain x1, x2, x3. But the two convex sets are disjoint, because if you intersect them, you get the intersection of all of these guys. So for every partition, I can find two convex sets that realize this partition. In particular, the convex halves of the two parts must be disjoint. OK. OK, so that's, uh, that's all I need for, from uh, convex spaces to now to, to talk about the main result and to prove it. OK, so, um, so I will, I, I hope I can uh, get rid of that. So by the way, there, in the 70s, they studied all possible connections between the Heli number, the Radon number, and the Karateodori number, and there are other uh, relations. And uh, it's, it's an, I think it's a nice, uh, it's a nice read, because uh, Is there a, a famous use of abstract convexity in algebra or in topology? Um, I don't know. Mathematical proof, not? Not that I know of, I don't know. So I know that this, you know, they had Grunbaum and Klee, and so there's the survey, and this has a lot of references. But I think it's mostly like a discrete geometry yeah, and uh, yeah. and this kind of uh, yeah. But maybe question, you know, maybe I'll give in the end an open question about example number five. Maybe this this can be interesting also for algebraized. Okay, so now I I will discuss the our paper. So weak nets. 
and main result okay so let me first define the notion of weak nets yes 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 yeah I would change it also the random uh, number would <laughs> I will omit the plus one okay so definition so we say that XC a convex space has the weak nets property weak nets if um, for every epsilon greater than zero there exists a bound n which is depending only on epsilon so n will depend only on epsilon that's crucial depending only on epsilon such that for every distribution on x yeah, so for any probability measure on x if you want you can just think on uniform distributions over finite on a finite support it's fine but I, I state it a bit more general so for every distribution on x there is a set there is a subset uh, n subset x of size n is at most this bound that depends only on epsilon that hits hits all c in c I should have called every distribution let's call it mu with mu of c greater than epsilon yeah so we will see many examples soon um, but basically let's repeat the definition once so we want a bound that depends only on epsilon let's say epsilon equals one quarter then this bound is is uh, 1000 and then we know that for any distribution the, the inversely choose any distribution on the domain you can find only thousand points that will hit all convex sets with measure more than epsilon. And this is an infinite con connection. OK, so let's see one example. So let's assume that uh, we, we are in the Euclidean plane. No, no. So the, the set itself and the, the net, yeah. the net depends on the distribution. But the size of the net is independent of the distribution. So there is a small hitting set for any distribution. And small is universally small, depending only on what you want to hit. But the only order but it can depend on the size of the X, right? So yeah, it can depend on the size of X. No, so we have some, I mean, this is just like hitting set or dispersal. Yeah, but no, no, if, if X is finite, you can take all of X. No, no, so the interesting examples will be for infinite X or that you want it to depend. So yeah, let me give you a, let me destroy the movie. We will see that it depends on the Radon number. The existence of such a thing in the, in the yeah, yeah, it's a family. yeah yeah so it can be a trivial it, tri it can be a trivial you want of course to minimize n of epsilon of course in a finite convexity space you can just take all the domain yeah, or but then the question is what is n of epsilon you yeah know, exactly okay. yeah. Okay. Just like okay so let's see one example so let's consider the plane r2 and this is the not the disk, the circle, right? The circle is the perimeter of the disk. So let's take the uniform distribution over the perimeter of the disk. OK? And I want to hit all convex sets whose measure is at least 1 half. So epsilon whose measure is more than 1 half, right? No, let's just focus on epsilon equals 1 half. I claim that you take just this point in the middle and you're done. It will hit all 
convex sets whose measure by this distribution is at least one half. Why? Because if you have a convex set which measures, measures at least one half, it must contain two antipodal points. And once it contains two antipodal points, the diameter will be the center. Okay? That's the most complicated example I could come up with when I was. <laughs> <laughs> When epsilon is small, it becomes more complicated. We'll see soon how. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So, for this example, maybe. Yes. But let me let me now give you the the historical background and the results for Euclidean convexity, and then we'll move to the abstract setting. Okay. So now, I hope. So here is a th theorem. Okay, then I'll give you history. Okay, so theorem and yeah, there are many many people. There. I'll just read them because it would take forever to. So it it was achieved by various subsets of Alon, Barani, Book, Chazel, Edelsbrunner, Furedi, Grigny, Guibas, Lovas, Matushek, Nivash, Sharir, and Velzel. Okay. <laughs> okay, so. I'm not going to write it down, but uh, yeah, I mean, as you can understand, that okay, so at first it was proven just for the plane, and that was done by uh, Barani, Furedi, and Lovas. Then it was extended by Alon, Barani, Furedi, and Kleitman, but they gave some uh, suboptimal bound, and then it was improved by the others, and so on and so forth. Okay, so... Um, so yeah, so now the convexity, yeah, for Euclidean, for Euclidean convexity, convexity, uh, dimension D, we have that N of epsilon and D is at most O tilde of 1 over epsilon to the D. And at least, uh, you know, it's at least the maximum between two things, exponential in square root of d over 2, and some, you know, some uh, omega of 1 over epsilon log to the d of 1 over epsilon. Okay, so let me explain. So yeah, this, the upper bound is clear. So for any distribution, there is a set of such a size that hits all large convex sets. So the lower bound, so this was done by Matushek. He showed that for epsilon equals 1 over 50, you need at least so many sets. And Did that. Exponential of square root of the over Yes. So it, the dependence on the dimension must be exponential. That's what I want to take from this, from this result. And. Okay, and this I actually don't remember. So I remember there was the result by Noga, and then it was extended, I think, by Book, Matushek, and Nivash. Um, so this is fantastic. Yeah, that's, uh, there is still a very large uh, gap here. What's the I think uh, 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 Noga, at least, I think, uh, believes that <laughs> this is tighter. But, um, um, Okay, maybe for the equals two, they know the right answer. Maybe, you know. Well, uh, yeah, then it's, <laughs> of course, otherwise you wouldn't think. Otherwise, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so, yeah, I have to admit that I'm not an expert on all of these papers, and I didn't read all the proofs, so don't ask me too many questions about it. Um, It's a good question. I've been trying to think about connection, how to apply these results in machine learning, but no, so far it was no, 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 no. No, in learning you want okay, okay, that's a good question. Okay, so in learning you want that the what what implies and equivalent to learning is that the set n okay. is from the support of the distribution. You sample from the distribution and you, you uh, yes, yes, yes. Then okay, so that's actually. Okay, so let's see. I wrote myself. Um, 
Yes, yeah, so what Roy mentioned now is that the amazing, okay, so there is a classical result in combinatorics, which is also closely related to machine learning, that whenever you have a set system, it doesn't have to be closed under finite intersections, but you know, when every set you can describe by a succinct formula, uh, let's say sine of polynomials, blah, 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 then there is a hit, a small, it has the same property. It will have the weak epsilon net property. And not only will it have the weak epsilon net property, you can construct an epsilon net by just sampling from the relevant distribution enough points. And the surprising uh, fact about this result is that the collection of convex sets is very complicated. Is, uh, so even here, you can basically, so any finite subset of this, uh, of the, um, of the circle, you know, is a, is a can be separated from its complement by a convex set. So it's very compli It's a very complicated family. You cannot succinctly uh, represent it. Infinite visitor. Infinite visitor. Yeah, yeah. And so that's kind of the surprising fact here, and that's where it deviates from learning. But I do believe there may be some connections. <coughs> but I still uh, okay. Let's think here. <laughs> Sample from here as many as many points as you want. Any finite number, you can always take the complement and you know just build. So let's say you sample this point, and this point, and this point. So you know you can always build a convex set. I mean even more. Okay. Then here, and then. Right. You can always find a very very large measure one, measure tending to one convex set that. Uh, misses all these points. It will never help you. Um, OK, so, so this brings me to the guiding question of, of, of our work, which is uh, actually was, uh, was um, inspired by, was asked in a paper by Alon, Kalai, Matushek, and Meshulam in 2001. Is, and this is which combinatorial properties of convex sets allow this behavior. So. We'll in particular, you know, we were uh, motivated, and uh, so we did a lot of work on VC dimension, and there you have a very clean combinatorial property that captures epsilon, strong epsilon nets. So is there some combinatorial property that captures weak epsilon nets? Not the strong Sorry? OK, so this is the guiding question. W what combinatorial properties enable this? And now we will give you a partial answer, and the, the rest is an open question. So let me now state the main result, and then we'll take a break. Um, OK. So this is the. Now I. <laughs> it's very simple. We're not standing here and. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So theorem. This is the main result. Okay. So let's also. Main result, actually the only result I will present. Um, so yeah, so let x c be a convexity space with other number a number r. Then. Um, one is that n of epsilon is at least y minus 2 epsilon times r. And 2 is that if x, c is compact, I will soon tell you what it means, and separable, then Ah, yeah, yeah. Or is it um, n of epsilon r 
is at most r over epsilon to the order of r square ln 1 over epsilon. So OK, this is just a function of r and epsilon. Don't waste your energy on understanding. No, okay, so n of epsilon is always no. for Was that n, n, of n, epsilon of yeah, n of epsilon, sorry. It doesn't matter if you can put r or Yeah, yeah, r is fixed, r is fixed, so. Okay, so n of, sorry, n of epsilon. Okay, so let's, uh, let's read it together. So for any space, if you have infinite radon number, large radon number, you don't have weakness, always. That's a barrier for having uh, weak nets. And then for nice, nice enough spaces that needs to be separable and compact, we also have uh, an upper bound. So for such spaces, Radon number captures exactly the existence of such objects, of weak nets. And now compactness is, ne is a necessary condition because if you allow non OK, so what does compactness mean? It means that the set of con collection of convex sets has the finite intersection property. Namely, if you have any family, infinite family with uh, an empty intersection, so there is a finite subfamily with an empty intersection. Just the standard compactness definition from topology for closed sets. But how is that related to having a Rodon number? Heli, yeah, so it's a kind of a finite Heli number. The Heli number is small to Rodon number. So the Heli number, uh, did we, did I, I, I removed it. I only defined it for, ah. Uh, where is it? No, 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 no. So let's read the definition for L number again. Is the minimum H shot set for any finite? Yeah. Okay. You take omega one. You take intervals over omega one. This is a convective space, and it's non-compact. And then uh, it has the Heli number um, two because it's intervals. But it doesn't have; it's not compact, and there everything fails. So we need this compactness assumption. But again, if we are just discrete uh, mathematicians in the finite case, we can always consider finite convexity spaces or countable, and there everything is uh, is well behaved. We don't have to worry about such such constructions. I, I personally find them interesting, but you may not. So, um, okay. So compact is necessary. Separability, I don't know whether it's necessary or not. We don't know. And in particular, I think one interesting example is number five. So, you know, for most groups, it will not be separable. And there, basically, what it means, what, so as I said, the <coughs> fact that uh, the group has a small Radon number, it means if you take large enough set of elements, then you can partition them in two ways so that the generated groups will intersect non-trivially. So if such a such a property holds. Is it true that you can also hit all large subgroups with a small, with a small uh, net? So again, the property in the group case is that if you take enough elements of the group, doesn't matter which size, more than half, then there will exist a partition so that the generated groups intersect on trivial. Yes. Right. So it's kind of independence. Uh, would be some linear, right? So if you if your group is a vector space, it's linear independence, right? So the subspaces will. Uh, um, okay, let me now give um, a couple of um, let me give one. I think nice corollary that is again inspired, inspired by machine learning. Um, which is again, it shows you, okay, I will interpret later. So corollary, um, if XC has epsilon nets, For some epsilon smaller than one half, then it has epsilon nets 
for every epsilon greater than zero. Yeah, 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 yeah. XC, nice. Nice equals compact and separable from now on, okay? Okay, and why is this true? Because if it has a, an epsilon for some epsilon la, la, less than half, then the radon number has to be finite, and therefore it must have epsilon for every epsilon less than half. And this is, I think, the nice thing that happens when you take such, you know, such definitions of weak nets that uses distributions and uh, mean, you know, there is a lot of probability theory, but you find one combinatorial dimension that captures them. And the same things happen in machine learning with boosting, you know, and all these, uh, so this, uh, yeah, I think it's very useful to understand such distributional objects using combinatorics. Okay, and by the way, <laughs> uh, we know so if you take the Cantor, the Klopen set in Cantor space, 0, 1 to the natural numbers with subcubes, then it, then it doesn't have epsilon nets for epsilon less than half, but it does have epsilon nets for any epsilon greater than half. So this is tight in some sense, except that we don't know what happens for epsilon equals 1 half. So if epsilon equals exactly 1 half, then we are not sure. So this is tight, and the, the example is subcubes for a countable domain. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, so let's see before. Yeah, and the open. I think the nice, oh, the open question that uh, I find very interesting is whether we can remove separability. So for subgroups, I think this is the. Um, Okay, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so for instance here, for subtrees, you can, uh, so, okay, so now we, there is some distribution in the tree, let's say the uniform distribution, and you wanna hit all large subtrees. You can show that you can do it with uh, roughly one over epsilon, four over epsilon or something, so, so this means that the upper bound is very, in, in this uh, abstract uh, setting, the upper bound is, uh, um, or the lower bound of this is at least is, can be sometimes linear, can be almost tight. I mean, okay, here the lower bound is not R over epsilon, it's, it's worse, but. Uh, I think the, the second one, the dependence on R, do you know if it's. Uh, well, even in the Euclidean space, you need some exponential dependence yes. the dimensions. The dimension is basically R. Right. Yeah, so you have them, and the D should appear in the exponent, at least. Yeah, in the Euclidean. Yeah, I, I erased it. Longer, yeah, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's mm. right. yeah, so, okay, so let, let me rephrase your question. So basically, what we don't know and what is still open is, so we know that there must be an exponential dependence on the Radon number. This is from the Euclidean case. Whether the exponential on epsilon, on one over epsilon, is close to linear, is quasi-linear, we don't know. It may be well that even in this abstract setting, it can be very, very uh, small. I don't know. Maybe this example. Maybe there's an easy answer. Also, I don't. I didn't think about it. What's the worst example you know? The Euclidean. Euclidean. Yes. Yes. Also, yes. the square in the exponent is not. Is it's not there. Is not. Yeah. I'm sorry. Euclidean right. Right. It also. It may also be unnecessary. So yeah. So this is a much worse bound than the Euclidean, and we don't have any lower bounds. So the quantitative uh, question is wide open, but also the qualitative qu question, whether for separable. Uh, whether separability is necessary, is, o is also also remains open. Do you think stronger separability maybe just doesn't? Uh, I don't know. Good question. I don't. Uh, let's think about it when I show you the proof. Um, yeah, just one one last um, comment is that. So, in a way, this is similar to. You will see soon that the lower bound is is simpler, is less, less, is simpler than the upper bound. So having, and uh, as I said, having finite product number is a barrier for any convexity space. So it's a little bit like Hall's theorem and like, I don't know, Kuratowski theorem or Nullstellenzad that there is some obvious barrier, or not obvious, simple barrier, 
here is having finite other number. And the upper bound, which is usually in all of these cases, is much more complicated, shows you that this is the only barrier, having a finite other number. Um, OK, so let's take five minutes break. And OK, so okay, so now we'll see the proofs. So let's begin with the lower bound. Yes, yeah, so OK, so lower bound. Yeah, so remember what I want to show you now is that if our space has a large radon number, then it must ha then n of epsilon must be large. What does it mean that n of epsilon must be large? We need to construct a distribution over x and show you that for this distribution, you cannot hit all large convex sets with too few points. Could you complete the distribution in the very good, very good, very good. Uniform, uniform distribution. Yes. Okay. So lower bounds. So yes. Yeah, so take take. R independent set x1 up to xr and consider the uniform distribution over it. Okay, so what do I want to show you now? Okay. First of all, what are the uh, sets of measure larger than epsilon? What are the convex sets of measure larger than epsilon? These are exactly the convex hull. convex hull. It's anything that contains a convex hull of uh, epsilon r points. Okay. Now, what we're going to use is a resulting graph theory about Knessel graphs, and we're going to show. Okay. So what do we want to prove? So let's say given an epsilon net capital N, we want to show that N is large. OK? Good. So consider, consider the following graph. So the vertices of the graph is all subsets subsets of x1 up to xr of size larger than epsilon times r. And what will be the edges? The edges. connect any two disjoint sets. OK, so I connect two subsets with an edge if and only if they are disjoint. Now, what I'm going to show to you is that I can color this graph, give a proper coloring of this graph using n colors. And then I'm done. Why am I done then? Because a result of Lovas says that uh, the chromatic number of this graph is at least 1 minus 2 epsilon times r, which is exactly the number that we see here. So this is the chromatic number of what is called, what is known as the Knessel graph. Um, so I say one minute, there is a plus two here if you want. Don't forget it. Uh, and this is tight. And I should say that I think one of the challenges that uh, Lovas has to so that was a, a conjecture. So this graph was studied by Knesser, and he conjectured that this this is the chromatic number, but it was only proven later in the 70s by Lovas, and that was the first application also of the topological uh, method in in combinatorics. However, we don't really so part of the challenge was in you know, getting the exact 
tight bound of the chromatic number. If you are willing to, to get an asymptotically, uh, asymptotically the same bound, but slightly less good, then there are other proofs. So I didn't know about them, but uh, there is one proof by, so it's not published, so Noga communicated it to us, and, there was, and him and Semerady proved it independently, but no one published it, and you can find it in our paper. We, in the appendix, it's very simple, uh, very combinatorial, no topology. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's like uh, there's an entropy of epsilon going on. I don't. I don't. I can't. Uh, it's it's simple. We can discuss it later. I can't. Uh, I don't remember the exact. Uh, but yes, it's one minus all of epsilon. At maybe even you can get as close as you want to two. I don't know. Let's. Uh, but if you just want to show that you know for a fixed epsilon, let's say epsilon equals one quarter, it it must be at least r or r of uh, omega of r, then it will it will work. Yeah, so maybe you will not get exactly these dependencies and the boosting result, uh, this uh, will not follow, but you still get a lower bound. Okay, so I claim, so how, how okay, so we have this graph and we want to color it, give a proper coloring, and we want to do it using N. How, how are we going to do it? Exactly. So for every set, the color of this set, so this every set here has measured more than epsilon. Therefore, it must be hit by n. So pick any element in n and design it as the color of this set. Now, uh, all I need to show you is this is the indeed the proper coloring. And this will follow from Radon independence. So what does it mean that it's a proper coloring? It means that two disjoint sets have different colors. But two disjoint sets, by the Radon independence, also have disjoint convex hulls. And therefore, they must have different colors. They cannot be hit by the same element. OK? Does it make sense? That was the, the. OK, I used the Radon by saying that two disjoint sets cannot be hit by the same element. Because two disjoint sets, they are disjoint, but maybe their convex hull will intersect, like we had with the circle, right? But the convex hull will also be disjoint, and that's exactly the definition of. Because they are radon independent, the, the, the points are radon independent. So the definition of radon independent means that whenever you partition them, the convex are disjoint. It's a, just using the definition. Um, right. Um, I mean. Maybe you can improve the dependence on epsilon somehow, that's true. Oh, right. But on R, I mean, there is the right. example of the subtrees that right. they cite. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, the dependence on epsilon is very weird, right? It's, uh, you you don't expect. The example to epsilon half in the core of epsilon. Sorry? You said that there was an example before right. that you can't improve the epsilon because for half it's uh, you know, uncountable. No, actually, it's countable. You just take. So, so what is the question? You want me to describe this question? This example? You said before that the, the example with the one half that uh, it's. it's uh, yeah. So the example you is. Have an epsilon a weakness for half, but not for other. Uh, yeah, so I can tell you the example. It's. Well, you show that you can't improve. Right. So the two must be the. Okay. No, <laughs> I mean. Yeah. Maybe there's one minus two epsilon times one over epsilon times r. I mean, yeah, okay. I agree that. Uh, that uh, but the dependence on epsilon, I expect it to be r over epsilon and not, not uh, something like, right? You expect it when epsilon, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would guess, it's just an educated guess, that it should be r over epsilon here also. So maybe it's this times one over epsilon. Because um, that's usually how epsilon net behave in. Okay, so, um, okay, so let's, Let's now see the, the upper bound. So I'm going to, you remember the definitions of Radon and Haley? Going to, maybe, maybe not. Uh, yeah, the proof was simple, right? Um, Okay, so the upper bound is a little bit more uh, 
demanding, but it's also, it's, I mean, the proof is simple, you will see. Um, okay, so now we are given, forget about compact for now, let's see if you can catch me where I use compactness in the proof, but it will hide pretty well. We have a separable convexity space, and we are given a distribution, and our goal is to construct a large, uh, small epsilon net. So probably the elements in the converse? Yeah. Okay. So the first observation is that if epsilon is large, so if epsilon is more than one minus one over r, or, or at least maybe uh, this, then uh, one point suffices. Namely, there exists a hitting set of just one point. Okay, so let's first assume that epsilon is large and then there will be like a inductive argument, uh, density in, uh, incrementing argument for small epsilons. So why is that the case? So I claim this follows by Haley. Okay. So first of all, we know that since the radon number is R, the Haley number is less than R. And now I claim that this follows by Haley's theorem. Why? So I claim that there is a point in the intersection of all convex sets of measure larger than this thing. I want to show that there is a point there. It's enough to show that there is an intersection in any D, in any R convex sets of measure larger than this. Very good, Yuval. So here I use because I had potentially an infinite family. So first I want to say that, but let's not get into it too much. So yes, yeah, so, um, so I want to show that there is a point in the intersection. So it suffices to show that any R sets of this measure intersects. And why is this true? Because the complement is too small. The complement is less than one over R. So there is a point that misses all of the complements, namely this point must be in the intersection. Do we just take the point in the I think I defined it, uh, I mean, I abused myself this morning with checking these inequalities, but I think I defined the epsilon nets with strict inequality, strict inequality, so it's fine. But uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's not uh, um, invoke my OCD, you know, it's already <laughs> Okay. Very good. Okay. So now what do we do for small? So, okay, so that's really an observation. So now we, the case of small epsilon. Okay. So the, for the case of small epsilon, we will use the following lemma. So by the way, here we didn't use the probability, right? What I just said is true for any convexity space, separable or not, with, uh, and this is maybe why it should hold in general. Um, okay, so there, there is this important lemma that we're going to use, and if there will be time, I'll be happy to prove it. It will be time and demand. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna call it metric epsilon net because this is where the notion of epsilon net is being abused. You know, in, in a metric space, space, epsilon net is a bunch of points such that any other point is epsilon close to one of them. But here we have, unfortunately, they also use epsilon net for this notion, which is again a complication. So I call it metric epsilon net. So, yeah, so again, we have, uh, we have XC is a, you know, is a, is a convexity space. The radon number is R. But you are using the same epsilon in the metric, maybe. You okay, the very good. Point. Thank you, Avi. Thank you. Delta. Delta net. Um, okay, so we have a convexity space. We have the radon number is R, and we have some distribution mu on X. So the statement is that th there is a metric delta net for the set of all half spaces. What do I mean by that? Um, okay, and we also given this delta greater than zero. 
then there exists uh, a set H that depends on delta of uh, on delta and on u of half spaces um, such that first of all the size of H is bounded by just a function of epsilon and r so it will be like epsilon uh, yeah 100 let's say over epsilon to the r so we have few sub few, few half spaces <laughs> <laughs> okay i guess i should leave my notes um 100 over delta to the r such that for any half space in the world, for every half space, H, there is some half space in the net. There is some round, you can round this half space such that the, the measure of the symmetric difference is at most delta. Let's read it again. So we're, no, we're now focusing on the set of all half spaces. Given the distribution, this defines the same metri metric on half spaces. The distance between two half spaces is the measure of their disagreement region, of their symmetric difference. Right, given this is a semi-metric, and um, I claim that this semi-metric has a small metric delta net. Namely, there is a small set of half spaces of size only 100 to the delta to the r, with the property that any other half space in the world is delta close to one of them. Okay. It's a code, it's like a code in, in computer science. It's a code for a whole, uh, it's a co it's small code for, okay, code you want it. Not code, but covering. Yeah, covering for, for yeah. Uh, in your head, usually it's not practice usually. Yes, yes, yes. You just take a maximal uh, code, oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, okay, and I will, uh, so this actually follows from a result of Hausler for VC classes, and maybe I will show it if you want, and if there will be time. But this is going to be the key, the key uh, tool we're going to use. So is it clear the, the the theorem? So we have a for any distribution, of course, we'll take the distribution that we want to hit. There is a small s uh, set of half spaces that approximates any other half space in the world. Okay. Now I will, I will sketch the construction, I will write the construction and we will discuss the proof verbally. Okay, so what is, okay, let me just, um, so the construction You wanted the distance between, so for every R, for every half space H, you can round it to an element in the net, and the, you're just rounded by losing the most delta measure. Um, here, the size of the. Um, so, let's discuss it later. Yes. No, it matters. I mean, it. The second answer, the, the second question, are there no to the first? Yes, okay. it matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what you what you need is uh, so this is equivalent that your uh, so this happens for set systems. If you want it to be uh, valid for any distribution, it's valid for set systems with a finite VC dimension. It's equivalent actually. And what you, but uh, yeah, but uh, maybe we'll get into it later, and then, uh, but at least the statement is <coughs> clear. <coughs> it's a uh, house. It's a bit more. Uh, yeah, it follows from the Savalema. 
Okay. So, yeah, by the way, one, one thing that I should have said in the beginning is that for separable convexity spaces, what do we know? We know that any convex set is the intersection of all half spaces containing it. Right? So this, this is true in the Euclidean convexity, right? Any convex set is just the intersection of all half spaces containing it, but this is true in general. Why? Because the separability says that for any point that does not belong, there is some half space certifying it. So I'm going to use it also. Uh, okay, so let's see the construction. So we are given given epsilon greater than zero and the distribution mu on x. So the first thing we're going to do is we pick a point x in x that hits all convex set C with mu of C uh, larger than 1 minus 1 over R. Okay, that we did by, by Haley. That's what, that was the case of large epsilon that I erased. So I can pick a point that hits all these huge convex sets of measure almost 1, at least 1 minus 1 over R. Now I'm going to, to, okay, now if epsilon is larger than, is l at least one minus one over R, then we are done. Then we turn output X. So, so far it's not very interesting. Now what happens if epsilon is small? Okay, so else pick a metric um, net, so uh, delta net of half spaces where delta so it's not important, epsilon over 4R squared. Okay, so we take epsilon, we divide it by, by roughly the square root of the radon number. And this, you know, this is just a calculation later that should work. So we pick, we picked an, a metric net for epsilon, for delta smaller than epsilon, much smaller than epsilon. And what do we do? So we, by recursion, we construct Um, an epsilon times one over plus one four r. Again, this is important. It's larger than epsilon. Net for the restriction of mu to n for every n in the net. Uh, for every n in H. So epsilon now is larger by induction. I can construct to any distribution in the world an epsilon, an, uh, such a net. And I do it only for the, for the restriction, restrictions of my distribution, my input distribution to all of the half spaces. So there are only this many of them, finitely many of them. What do, you mean, well, what do you mean by restriction? Conditioning, right? Just the conditioning of the distribution to the half phase. Yeah, yeah. So the mu. Only to one of the distributions. Yeah. So I construct many, many, many uh, delta nets, and then I just return. I just output the union of these nets. And the point X, the heli point, the point given by the heli theorem. You are having pain. You're physically suffering when you no, see no, this inefficiency. <laughs> because I, because I have to, you know, because of, I have to 
the yes, top. I agree, I agree. But again, uh, I, think yeah. I think the message here is not a quantitative message, it's more a qualitative message that uh, finite further numbers suffices for, and that was also our focus. And yeah. So you want to decouple it by Haley, actually? Because yes, yes, you here you can replace it by Haley, or actually by the, and, and the other one you can replace it by the VC dimension of the half faces, but so I, we could have right. make it more complicated, but but I rather have a simple statement and. Yeah. Uh, but you are right; it's there. Are, there's place for improvement, probably. Um, okay, so the construction is clear. So now let's 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 prove correctness. Uh, yeah. Okay. Maybe I should first argue that it terminates, but I think this is uh, so. You just you know. You always multiply by y one plus one over four r, and uh, until exponential in in uh, r many steps, you will achieve this condition, and you will just output a single point. Mm -hmm. So the recursion depth is is exponential in in r or something like that. Um, is it possible to base a point x even in the general? Yes. Okay. It's the base. It's the base case of the induction. You cannot do without the base case of the induction, right? It's a okay. So let's see the proof. Okay. So so why is this correct? Okay. So what do I need to show you? That any convex set with a measure larger than epsilon is hit by by one of these by, by this union. Okay, so let's consider two cases. Um, sorry, just I'm confused, but you will show that uh, at some depth, epsilon, the weather no matter some you know, R is hit somewhere, right? Like the base case is only, base case only works when epsilon is large enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if epsilon is small, then you have to show that. Uh, Maybe one of four R instead of two. Oh, I see. So there is a. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So. I missed so this is what increases during the recursion, and in the end it will hit the, the roof. Um, okay, so what I need to show now, that for every convex set C with measure larger than epsilon, will be hit by one of these guys. So there are two cases. So we, okay, now I'm going to use what I said before. So we know that this convex set is the intersection of all half spaces containing it. Now, if all half spaces, so case one, so yeah, we have convex at C, and we know that mu of C is larger than epsilon. So case one, all half spaces containing C are large. Large and by large I mean uh, mu of mu is at least one is greater than one minus one over r. If all half spaces containing it are large, then there is a single point that hits all of these half spaces. So even if c is small, it will also hit c. This x from the base case, it will also hit c. Right? The second case, we know wh what is the negation of this. So there exists half space containing C uh, with this half space is not too fat. Its measure is lesser than or equal to 1 minus 1 over R. What I'm going to do next? So, 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 right. If I could, what what do we know about the restriction? Consider mu to this half space. What happened to the measure of c in this restriction? It's increased by plus one over r. Yeah. So, if I could just, you know, construct. If, if I was lucky enough and this h is part of my net, then I'm done because, because the, the measure of c restricted to h 
grew by a large factor, large enough factor. Unfortunately, we may not have H in this net that we chose, but what we do have is something that is close to H by enough close. You choose delta small enough, and I'm not going to. And you show that the same thing holds. So you show that you pick a half space in the guy that is close enough to this lean half space that contains C, and you show that the measure of C increases by 1 plus 1 over 4 R, and therefore C will be hit there. And I'm, I'm sparing you the calculation, even though maybe we can improve something there. It's there. Is there a quick reason why you need quadratic C small delta in the denominator? Okay, that's, uh, <laughs> that's exactly what I'm sparing you from. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's and somehow there is a translation between the, a metric net and the density somewhere, right? Yes. So somewhere there is yeah, I mean, I, I'll be happy to to discuss it offline this uh, this calculation, but I don't want to do it. I mean, it's really the idea is very simple. It just um, okay. So I guess we are done with the proof. Um, how much time do we have? Yes, yes, I want to talk about the proof of the lemma. Okay. So this is actually a very cute application of the, of the probabilistic method. Um, OK, <laughs> so now we will set another lemma that I will not prove. But, uh, <laughs> but this is it. The, the last lemma, this is the lemma that is the first basis. So this is the. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the next lemma I'm setting probably is known for most of you, at least. It's a corollary of what I'm going to show next. It's no, it's not. There is nothing. Uh, it's just I kn we knew about it. <laughs> That's it. I mean, maybe I said it in a little bit confusing way, but um, okay. So the first observation. I didn't do this. So the first observation. Yeah. So I want to prove it now. So the first observation is that the VC dimension of half spaces. is at most the Rado number. I don't want to define VC dimension because, no, actually, maybe I do want to define VC dimension. Um, no, I don't have to. OK, so. You are looking at finite? No, I, I take the set of all half spaces of my convexity space. This is a set, this is a family of subsets. And I claim that the VC dimension of this family is at most the Radon number. Yes, it would follow from the definition of Once you know the definition of VC dimension, it follows from the definition of Radon number. This right. is a very really important uh, complement uh, to have a such a family that falls under form. Yes. Um, I'm not sure, actually. It's not, uh, not sure. It's no, I mean, no, no. I, mean I just want to prove this theorem. This. Uh, yeah, but what about what, what makes half spaces special among all convex sets? They generate your family. Every convex set in the family is an intersection of half spaces. No, but the family of convex sets has the property that they are generated by a family of a small VC dimension. Yeah, they are also generated by a family of. I'm not sure we no, talk about the same question. Two questions. One is why does it imply the lemma, and the question is why this lemma. So <laughs> yeah, so the question is, uh, yeah, if your uh, convexity space was not separable, what else would be in your thing set? Yes, Can yes, that's that's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's it a good is question. It's always true that uh, you know, uh, uh, any convex uh, space is generated by a set. Yeah, uh, I. Uh, So I think that um, if you take the trivial convexity space, oh. x2 to the x, then it's generated by the, by the family containing the whole set and all whole set minus a singleton. So take the whole set yeah. and take whole set minus a singleton. And this has this dimension 1. It's just a humming ball around the all one vector. And it generates everything, so it's not enough to. 
So it's not so what I'm <laughs> what I'm saying is that it's not enough to be generated by a family of what finite. Order, 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 number is one. The order number is x plus one. There is very large. It's like s right. I, I you look at this convexity space. So I claim that the convex sets here are generated by a family of this dimension one. Okay, so I misunderstood. So it's not enough to have a finite to have to be generated by a family of small VC dimension in order to have weak nets. That's what I'm saying, but that's not what you asked. No, it's not what I, asked. I asked whether every space has a, a, a subset of uh, convex sets generated, uh, such as the VC dimension of that family of sets is a closer random number of that space. It's not going to there. It's true there, but here it's also true and useless in some sense, right? Here it's true, but we cannot use this generating family to do anything useful because there, are the, there is no weak epsilon nets here. So what I'm saying, I don't know if it's true for every space, but there are some, su some spaces for which it is true, and they have no weak epsilon nets whatsoever. Um, okay, so the visit dimension of house spaces is at, is at most r, and the Sauer lemma says that if you have any sub, uh, you have any family of subsets with, uh, let's say, yeah, two to the x, um, two to the n, let's do it, with VC dimension um, at most d, then the size of of this family is at most n choose lesser than or equal to d. So it's roughly n to the d. OK, that's, that's our lemma. So let's just, con OK, so let's now prove it only for the finite case. So now. You give me a set, uh, systems of set, system of sets of this dimension d, and I want to show you that there is a small uh, net. You also give me a distribution over the domain, let's say the uniform distribution, doesn't matter. And I want to show that there is a small subfamily such that any other set in the family is close to one of them. Okay? So I'm going to restrict myself to the, final, to the finite case, and I also assume that the distribution is uniform over 1 to n. OK, so what is, so this is related to, to what I've said before. What is uh, such a set that is, is a net, a metric epsilon net, a metric delta net? One way to construct it is just to take a maximal code, a maximal set such that the distance between every two elements in the set is at least epsilon over 2, or 2 epsilon or whatever at least epsilon, at least delta. So what I'm going to show is that there are no large codes. Families of, of, of small vc dimension do not contain large codes. The size of the largest code is one over epsilon to the d, roughly. And how, do I go, how am I going to do that? So here we're going to use this lemma. And uh, OK, so let's assume that um, f prime sub subset f satisfies for every f uh, different, distinct, we have that the symmetric difference of them is larger than delta. I'm going to prove that any such set has to be small. And if you take a maximal set with this property, you get a metric uh, delta net. Because if you cannot add anything, it means that everything is close to something in your set. Yeah, so you gave me a really good code, and a delta code in F, and I'm going to show you it's, it's a shitty code. It's very small. OK? Um, OK. So let's, you know, let's denote the size of f prime by t. 
And let's assume, just for convenience of imagination, that mu is uniform on 1 to n. Now, what happens if you sample roughly t log n, uh, 100 t log n, and sorry, 100 uh, log t maybe? 100 log t independent coordinates. So let, let's fix f prime uh, some, uh, some fixed uh, two elements in, in, f in this code. If I sample a coordinate uniformly at random, the probability that it will, that they will disagree on this coordinate is at least delta, right? Because the measure of coordinates where the disagree on is at least delta. So by, right? 100 over delta squared even. Right? Yeah, thanks. So if you sample enough coordinates, and you need roughly log size of the set, so you, you want for every, so for every pair you have a bad event that you didn't hit it, you want to hit all, no, maybe delta is enough. Delta, delta. delta is enough. You want to, that none of these bad events will occur, you need roughly, by the union bound, you need roughly this many, this will suffice, then the probability. So what do we know? We know that there exists a set of this many coordinates such that any two, any two, they disagree on this very small, tiny set of coordinates. Okay, and what do we know? So we know that how many different patterns, how many, how many projections of, so if you take, let's call this, yeah, so, so we have uh, a set y of uh, 100 log t over delta coordinates. Separating f prime, right? Now take the projection of f to this set y. How many different uh, subsets will you see in this projection? By the Sauer's lemma, you will see at most 100 log t over delta to the d. Right? We have, we have a set of, this is dimension d, on, on some, on, you know, some k coordinates, number of different patterns you see is, k is, is number of coordinates to the d. So we know that t satisfies this formula. On the one hand, we see all of them because we chose enough coordinates at random. On the other hand, the number of distinct things is at most this thing to the d. Walk it out, and you'll get a slightly worse bound than I wrote before. And uh, yeah, so I hope it was somewhat clear. I didn't prepare this part, so. <laughs> Yeah, you, you use the Sauer's lemma in there. Yes. Yeah, so the only thing I didn't prove is the Sauer's lemma, but the, and this is really like there are very basic proofs. So, um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you. <laughs>